everyone, how's it going? Hope uh, you and your families are staying safe and healthy during this time. Um, I believe Kavina has taught you guys about the background of northern blotting and why you would want to perform a northern blot, what it helps do scientifically or medically, but uh, I'm here to teach you about the technique and how you would go about doing a northern blot. So basically, you're going to start out with a sample. You're going to extract the RNA out of it through a gel electrophoresis. You're going to, and this is going to separate the RNA by size for you to see. You're then going to transfer this RNA to a membrane, which is then going to be fixed with heat, which is then going to be probed by specialized probes that you're going to have made up before the procedure. Um, and then you'll be able to view the probes mixed with the RNA under a, some sort of light technique that will let you to see dark spots on a x-ray film. So what kind of sample do you need to use for a northern blot? Well, it has to be homogenized, meaning that it has to come from the same group of cells. So if I want to take a northern blot of human tissue from some organs, I can't have liver cells mixed with small intestine cells. It has to be homogenized, so all of them would have to be either liver or small intestine cells. Um, and these can either be a, a sample of the tissue itself, or it can be a culture of the cells. Um, after you collect your sample, you're going to separ separate each sample into RNA sequences, and you are eventually ultimately going to do this through gel electrophoresis. And since we've done a couple through lab, I'm not really going to go through the steps of a gel electrophoresis, but I will explain what you will need for the specific gel electrophoresis. All right, how to separate RNA sequences with the gel electrophoresis. So just like our labs, we're going to be using an agrogose gel, but this one is going to contain formaldehyde, which is going to limit the secondary structures of RNA. That way we're only getting the primary structures. Um, a uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis with urea can also be used, although it is not as common as the one with formaldehyde, so you won't see that one quite as often. So the uh, samples can be stained with ethidium bromide, so you can view them under a light before transferring them to the membrane. So if you just want to check that you have good samples, that's a good way to do it. Um, these samples are often run with an RNA ladder and ribosomal subunits to help determine the size of your sample. And this ultimately separates the nucleic acid sequences. So here I have an example, picture is not the greatest, of what you would run with your samples in order to help determine size. So you have your RNA ladder over here and then you have your subunits over there. The larger subunits is going to subunits are going to be at about five kb, and the smaller ones are going to be at two kb. And here is an example I found online of someone running a gel electrophoresis for their uh, northern blotting. So they chose to do plants, so plants and fruits or whatnot. So they have their ladder over here, then they have all of their samples lined up here, and they have their RNA smears on here, which they will later put onto a membrane. So after you've run your gel electrophoresis, it is time to transfer it onto the membrane. And the reason for this, that you can't go straight from the gel into the probes, is the probes will break the gel, therefore ruining your sample. So the gel is then transferred onto a nylon membrane. And this nylon membrane needs to be positively charged in order to attract the negatively charged nucleic acids. Uh, formamide is used as a transfer buffer to lower the annealing temperature of the probe and RNA interaction. This will eliminate heat and heat can damage the RNA. So this is a very good thing to use in order to do that. And the way you'd go about transferring a, the RNA from the gel to the, uh, the nylon membrane is this little apparatus thing I have 
a picture of right here. So all this is going to be done in the formamide, which is this transfer buffer right here. You're going to have your gel right here, your nylon membrane, and then a couple, uh, you're going to have blotting paper, and then your paper towels, and then a not a heavy weight because you don't want to crush your samples, but you're going to get a decent weight that will allow the blot to happen between the membrane and the gel, and in between that you're going to have a glass plate. So now that your RNA is on your membrane, you are going to run it under a UV light. And this UV light is going to give off radiation and it will fix the RNA onto the membrane so they're not moving around. And after you've got your RNA secured on your nylon membrane, it is time to introduce the probes. <clears throat> now the probes. The probes, they can be complementary to part or the whole RNA. And they can either be made up of RNA, DNA, oligonucleotides, which could be 25 complementary base pairs of the desired RNA. And once you have your probe determined, you hybridize it with the RNA, mix it with the RNA uh, on the membrane, which will reveal if your sample has the desired gene that you were studying. Um, the membrane is then washed to assure that the extra, any extra probe that you may have smeared somewhere, that gets rinsed away or no outside signals that may have gotten onto the membrane during the transfer will show up on your reading. So for your results, uh, intermediate oh, I'm sorry, I butchered that. Um, densitometry can be used to interpret your results. Um, these, this will give you dark bands on an x-ray film if you have the gene if it has, the sample has the gene that you are looking for. Um, the samples not containing the gene of interest can be used as controls for other blotting experiments. So that because you know that they do not have the gene, so you can use them as controls for another experiment looking for that same gene. So here I have an example of somebody's northern blot results. They were doing um, different parts of a human, human anatomy. We have stuff like the heart, the brain, the lungs, and the liver. So basically how you would go about interpreting these results is you see that in this experiment, they used three different probes for different genes to test and see whether they had the gene here. And like I said in the previous slide, a dark spot is going to represent that it contains the gene of interest. So we see that for the liver and the PSAT gene, the liver has a dark spot, so therefore it would have the PSAT gene. And you may ask, well, what if there is a really faded spot, like the thymus right here for the PSAT gene, has a very small spot? Well, that just means that there's not that much of the PSAT gene in the thymus. So as opposed to the B actin gene and skeletal muscle, there's a relatively big blot right there. So you could assume that the B actin gene is heavily present in skeletal muscle. And from these results, you can interpret that the B actin gene is actually in all of the samples collected, while the PHGDH gene is in about 75%, and then the PSAT gene is in about 50%. Uh, this concludes my information for the northern blotting technique. Um, hope you guys learned, and uh, you can shoot questions down in the chat, and me and Kavina will get right to them. Thanks.